Okay, make sure just real quick, I'm not gonna like read the whole email, but I did send out an email for the face-to-face -face class. I just sent it like just before I came in here. Um, for the online class, I sent it last night. Okay, but there is an issue um, in the online classes announcement. I did make uh, a typo. So um, for the online class, they need to make sure that they're reading the correction announcement and not the original announcement. Okay. Um, and then for your class, I actually made another different mistake. I have the correct message in here, but I forgot to attach the attachments for all of the test solutions. Okay. So make sure that you're, if you're in the online class, you're reading the corrected announcement. And if you're in the face to face class, make sure you're reading the announcement, of course, but then also the get the solutions from a separate email. Okay. It should look like the way mine looks. So they should be like right above each other in when you look for it in campus. Okay. Okay, so that's that. Um the big idea here is that it's got a bunch of stuff. Um, but on Friday, I'm gonna start emailing everyone a what I call a midterm report. So basically, I'm just gonna go in and look and see what you've done, what you haven't done, how long you've been working in there just to get an idea of your effort in the class so far and how that's paying out for you, okay? And then if I see anything in there that stands out to me like, oh, this is not a good practice to be doing, or you know, maybe you need to spend more time, or maybe you need to do more homework, whatever the situation is for each individual student, I will give suggestions for improvement, okay? If you're doing like super awesome and you're doing all your homework and you're taking all the tests and doing pretty darn good, then my suggestion would probably just be keep doing what you're doing, right? Um, but if I do have any other kinds of suggestions, I will include those on that midterm report, okay? Midterm grades are due on Monday. So we're not gonna be taking any more tests or anything between now and Monday. So I truly do have to use whatever I have on that midterm report as your midterm grade, okay? And so when you go log into ACES, I think next Tuesday, the midterm grade should roll over. And so you should be able to see them inside ACES if you're curious. You should already know what it's gonna be because it will be included on that midterm report when I hand it to you or when I email it to you, sorry. Um, so you'll know what grade is gonna be in there. Now, don't freak out because we are at a super important cusp in the class because it really, not to say that your performance before now didn't matter. It does matter because it's what set you up for the rest of the class, right? So if you've been doing super awesome, then you're pretty set for the rest of the class. You just need to keep doing what you're doing. If you haven't been doing pretty great, now is the point in time where you have to change that. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you want to still be successful at the end, this is the time where things got to start going in a different direction for you if they weren't going in a positive direction before. Okay. Does that make sense? So again, we're not at the point of no return, right? Um, that probably won't be so closer. Let's see if we do. <laughs> that won't be closer. That will not happen until we're closer to like uh, Thanksgiving break. When we get closer to that point, I'll do it again, this reporting, and just see where everyone's at and then start getting that emails out and to hopefully start some conversation because at that point, we would be at the point of no return. And at that point, people can make a determination on whether or not they want to remain in the class or they want to drop the class. And hopefully everyone wants to remain, right? And hopefully everyone wants to be successful. So I'm just hoping. <laughs> this is just my way of trying to put things into perspective and kind of help you guys out to figure out how to navigate the rest of the semester. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so for today, we actually are going to continue and we're going to finish the very last section that we have in this whole unit. Um, and so before I do that, uh, don't forget, I'm going to try to remind, remind, remind you guys at the end of class, but Romito and Frederick, if you guys have your um, unit C test, let me have that before you leave today so I can add your points on there, okay? I have your corrections and I can hand those back to you, but I can't actually give you the points until I know how many to give you, okay? So I need that other, the original test so I can give you back those points. Okay, um, dun, dun, dun. so let's go ahead and cut to our paper. Now I have a question. For the online class, 
they can download and face to face class honestly. Um, you can download the workbook that I'm using right for notes. It just dawned on me yesterday. I don't know why. I think, oh, I know why. Because <laughs> I saw a stack of workbooks in my office. That's why. These papers that I'm using, they come from that workbook, right, that I gave you guys at the very beginning, like the first phase to first, second phase to phase meeting that we had. Um, the, they are also available in the website, right? If you click on the title of unit, whoever, right, this one's unit D. So if you click on the title unit D inside web assign, and I think I have a link to it in the modules as well. If you click this, it does take you to that um, document. Because I think someone also asked me, like, where are you getting these papers? I'm just writing on my notebook paper, but I would like to write on this. Um, and they are in here. So if you click the drop down hour for description, it is in there, just this specific unit. Okay, not the whole stack of workbook. So you can't get them in there. If you need a workbook, I do have a couple of extras. So if you want one, let me know because I can go grab it um, so that you have one. Because I think there might have been a couple of people that were absent that day. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that before we keep going. So today's 1.8, and to be honest, it's not anything super new, okay? It really is just taking two different ideas and putting them together, okay? So one of those ideas is when we were solving the polynomial inequalities. Do you remember that whole process, right? We're gonna be doing that same process, okay? Then the second idea that we're gonna connect with that is those restrictions on our domains when we have rational uh, expressions. Like, so when we have fractions, right, with X's downstairs, those X's downstairs create restrictions to what numbers I can plug into the fraction. Right? So we're basically taking those two ideas together. So restricted values for fractions and solving polynomial inequalities. Put those two together and now you can solve rational inequalities. Okay, so fraction inequalities. So um, it's still the same process as before. In order for you to solve a rational inequality, you have to find those key numbers, right? You have to test all the intervals that the key numbers create. Um, and then there's only one little extra bit to it, okay? Um, oh, this is the extra bit. So the X values, it says use the fact that the value of a rational expression can change sign only at its zeros where the x values for which its numerator is equal to zero. So this, the way they word it is a little bit weird, but essentially what they're telling you in like real words <laughs> is that you're going to take the numerator and that's gonna be the polynomial that you're trying to solve the inequality for. It's just the numerator, okay? So your polynomial is gonna come from the numerator. However, you also have to keep in mind that there's undefined values for when x when your denominator is equal to zero. So you are gonna solve the polynomial for the numerator. However, you also have to consider what happens when the denominator is equal to zero. It's gonna create holes in that number line, isn't it? So those are also going to be key numbers, okay? So essentially you're gonna get key numbers from your numerator and you're going to get key numbers from your denominator. Does that make sense? Once you have those key numbers, you just plug everything into the little sections and you do the same process as you did before. Okay, so for this one, it said where the numerator equals zero and the denominator equals zero, but there's a problem here because this is not all just one fraction, is it? Right? And so for this one, I'm glad that this was the first step because in order for you to solve these rational inequalities, they have to be in this form. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So it has to be your rational expression. And then whatever symbol, the less than, the greater than, the less than or equal, greater than or equal, doesn't matter which symbol is here. But then you have to have zero over here on this side. Okay. They have to be in this form in order for you to do the rest of the process. Okay, so the first thing that they did was they went ahead and subtracted the three over to the left-hand side. 
right? That's pretty easy to see, not too bad. Then they did that little TP thing. So if I put this over one, when I multiply 2x minus 7 times 1, don't I just get 2x minus 7? Then I have to do negative 3 times the x minus 5. Well, that means I would have to multiply both of them by negative 3, right? And so this guy times negative 3 is negative 3x, and the negative 3 times negative 5 is going to get positive 15. Okay, so they're just doing the TP idea. And then what do you get when you do one times X minus five? It's just X minus five, right? So if they are doing the TP, I probably would have had a step in the middle there with me trying to apply the TP pro uh, process, but they just went straight into the, what happens afterward, okay? Now from here, they're just combining their like terms. So the X's come together to make negative X, the constants come together to make positive eight, and now you have it as one simplified rational expression, an inequality symbol, and then that's zero, right? So now it's finally set up for me to go, okay? You do have to take both your denominator and your numerator and set them equal to zero. And of course, they don't show you that. So you do have to take the numerator equal to zero and the denominator equal to zero. And so we have negative x plus 8 equal to 0 and x minus 5 equal to 0. Now here I'm actually going to add x to both sides because that's the fastest way to solve this. So I get 8 equals x. And here I'm going to add 5. That would be the fastest way to get x by itself. A positive x, right? So then now you see where these two key numbers came from, right? This one came from the numerator and that one came from the denominator. So when you put those on the number line, which they kind of just went straight into the answer here, but for me, I would create that number line and I would put this one smaller. So I would put five over here and eight over there. And it does create these intervals, right? This left-sided interval is this interval, right? The one in the middle between five and eight is this one. And the one from eight going on is this one. Now, there are no they just put parentheses around everything. They did not decide whether or not they were going to be brackets just yet, okay? Because this does have a bar, doesn't it? So it's possible that there could be brackets on one, both, or none of these two numbers, okay? We have to decide that in just a second, okay? So let's test everything. So if you test the number in here, you could pick zeros over here, right? Then zero on the left of five. So I'm going to plug zero into this um, equation that I have here. You could also plug it into the original. As long as you did all of your math right, you can plug it into here. If you don't trust your math, you can plug it into the original. Okay. Hopefully, you can trust your own work. Okay. So if I plug zero in here, I'm going to get eight over negative five. I'm sorry. That's a negative number. Is a negative number less than zero? It is. So this section works, okay? Then we're gonna go test the other one. So we're gonna test, what number do you wanna test in here? Six, okay. So then we'll have negative six plus eight and six minus five. This would be a positive two and that would be a positive one, which gives me a positive two in the end. Is positive two less than or equal to zero? It's not less than. So this section does not work. Don't assume that the other one's gonna work because sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so make sure you actually test the other side. What number can I test over here? Sure, you can test 40. I've intentionally tested like a thousand before. Like 1,001, I'm gonna test that. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Oops. I have to put a negative 40 there, don't I? No, not a negative. Positive 40. So then what do I get on top? Negative 32. And on the bottom, 35. Does it matter what the number is? It's the sign we're looking at, right? Is a negative less than or equal to zero? It is. So this section actually did work. Now, here's where the struggle comes in. How do I know that or why is there a parentheses here but a bracket over there? Okay. 
and this is where this is how you decide okay if the key number comes from the numerator use the inequality symbol to decide however if the key number comes from the denominator can it be included no so it would have to be a parentheses Okay, so the eight is the one that came from the numerator, right? So that one, we're gonna use this symbol. Since this symbol has a bar on it, then it will have a bracket on the eight, okay? But the five came from the denominator. And so that's why that one always has to have a parentheses. I cannot plug in five. If I plug in five into that original fraction, it gets undefined, right? How the heck would I know if undefined is greater than or equal to zero? Right, you wouldn't. So make sure you put parentheses on the guys that come from the denominator. That's why I find it super important to write this and then start solving so that I know where each one came from. Okay, so that I can remember at the end. So let's see if I'm pretty sure you don't strictly practice this. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. There are one, two, three, four of them to practice. And then we'll go into the web assigned see if there's any things that like wacky that we haven't talked about. Okay, so for this one, do I need to do any manipulating to this one before I start finding key numbers? It's already got it, right? Fraction, a symbol, and a zero. Okay, so we're just going to take that numerator and equal it to zero and the denominator equal to zero. So the numerator is 4x minus 1 and the denominator is just x. So here, I'm not going to go through all the steps. Can you look at that and do it fast? What's it going to be? Yes, positive 1 fourth. Good. And then that one's already solved. It? Okay. So I'm going to do my number line. And who's on the left and who's on the right? Zero. Zero on the left. It is smaller than a positive number, isn't it? So now we'll do our little test points. So what number do you want to test in this section? Negative one, sure. So we'll do four times negative one minus one over negative one. So I get negative four minus one, which is negative five. This will end up being what? Positive or negative? Positive. And is a positive greater than zero? It is. So this section does work. Okay. Now, what one number do you want to test in the next section? Yeah. No, you can't no. test one in there. It has to be something really funny. This is what? 0.25? So could I check like 0.1, right? It's a decimal, but that's okay. We're really only looking for the signs here. So I'm gonna get a 0 0.4 minus one, which I think is negative 0 0.6, but let's make sure. Or 0 0.1 minus one. Yes, it is negative 0 0.6. And it doesn't really matter the number here. What sign do you get when you do a negative divided by a positive? You get a negative. And is a negative greater than zero? No. So this section does not work, right? Then we go to the last one. Here we can do one, right? And one is going to be to the right of the one four. And that happens. So always just double check. Don't be too quick to pick your test numbers, right? Especially when there's fractions involved. So that's gonna be three over one, which is positive. And positive is greater than zero. So now I need to decide, 
the one that came from the denominator, I know is going to have what? Parenthesis. It has to. Okay. But the one that came from a numerator, I have to go look at the symbol to decide. And according to this symbol, should I have a parenthesis or a bracket? Parenthesis. Only the bars get brackets, right? So then these two sections are my answer, and it's going to be from negative infinity to zero with the parentheses, and then one four to positive infinity. Infinities always get parentheses, right? So this is your solution. On the unit C test, you did have not fractions, but you did have inequalities, right? On that test. Um, people were not showing me everything. They either weren't showing me where the key numbers came from, or they weren't showing me how they decided whether the sections were good or bad. Um, but there was something missing in that process. So make sure you're showing all of that process, okay? That's how I know you're not guessing. Like you actually have proof of why you're saying what you're saying, right? Okay, so this one, number two, I'm gonna need my paper because that's not gonna fit in that little box. Number two, does that one need to be manipulated before we can start doing all of this process like we did here? Before we do the numerator, the denominator, equal to zero. This one does require because it needs to be that fraction, the symbol, and then a zero. And mine does not have a zero over here, okay? So we're gonna minus the three. And now I will have a zero, right? But this has to be one giant fraction, right? So we're gonna do that TP process. So this times this, and then minus three times that denominator. And then at the bottom, you multiply the two denominators together, right? That's the whole TP process. And then I would set this equal to zero and this equal to zero, but I usually like to clean it up first before I go writing equations. So distribute the one, does nothing. Distribute the negative three, and I get this. And then if I distribute the one here, it's just x minus one. I think I can clean that up a little bit more before I keep going. There we go, now we've got it. I had a couple of people last night doing some problems and they're like, these problems are taking like a whole page. Well, yeah, they do. And when I use a pre-count calculus, they take multiple pages. This do a lot of steps and a lot of process. And that's really what the challenge is with these problems, is that they are so long. And can you do that long process without losing focus, right? That's the whole point of it. If you're losing focus, that's when we know you need more practice with it, okay? So now that I have it exactly the way it should be, it's just like the way this one was, right, up here, where you have a fraction, your symbol, and your zero. So now is at the point where I can take my numerator equal to zero and my denominator equal to zero to get those key numbers. So then I get x equal to negative 10 and I get x equal to one. Now on the number line, Who's going to go on the left and who's going to go on the right? Uh, negative 10 here and positive 1 there, right? So let's think of those little test numbers. What number can I test over here? Sure.
So I'm going to end up with what sign in the numerator? I don't even care about the number. What sign am I going to end up with? If the bigger number is negative, I should end up with a negative. And if both of them are negative, I'm just going to have a bigger negative, aren't I? And what's a negative divided by a negative? Positive. And is positive less than zero? No. So this section is bad. Doesn't work. Okay. Let's test the next section. What number do you want to use in there? Yes, my favorite. Okay. So we have zero and zero. Up top, I'm going to get one sign. And on the bottom, what sign? Negative. And so then when I divide these two, what do I end up with? Negative. And our negative is less than zero. They are. This section does work. Now, one number in here. Two. Okay, so two plus 10, two minus one. We get a positive up top. And what do we get at the bottom? Positive. And so when I divide those, I get a big positive, right? Are positive less than zero? No. So this section does not work. Now, denominator key numbers should always have what? Always. So I'm going to have a one, a parenthesis on one. The numbers that come from the numerator, you have to look at your inequality. Okay. So according to this inequality, what kind of symbol should I have on negative 10? parentheses also. So then what is my final answer? My final answer will be negative 10 to 1. I mean, I probably could use half the paper, but I would have had to have written a lot smaller, right? Some of y'all write really small. small. You might be better. Take more trees for me. But <laughs> I like to write big on blind and I can see everything. It just looks better for me. Okay, number three. I might be able to hit that one as long as I start with up here. Okay, so is this one ready to go? I don't know what's their fascination with threes. Every single time it's been a three, right? It doesn't have to be a three. It be any other number over there. Okay, so we're going to minus the three over. So I'm going to have x plus. 18 over x plus 4, but when I move that over, it's going to become minus 3, right? And then I'm going to do a little TP thing. So I'm going to say 1 times x plus 18, and then negative 3 times x plus 4, and then 1 times x plus 4 at the bottom. Just distributing this all this stuff, that three distribution here. So when I'm done, I will have negative two X and a positive six. Now are we ready to do the whole numerator denominator business? We have our fraction, our symbol, and our zero now, right? So I'm going to take my numerator and equal it to zero, and then my denominator. So here, I'm going to ask you again, I do this fast. What will I get here? Positive? Yes, because this was over as a negative six, and then if I divide it by a negative two, right, it would be positive. And here, what would I get? Negative two. So let's draw that number line. Negatives go on the left, positives go on the right, so those are not too bad. Now we need our testing numbers. So what number? Do we test on the left? Sure. So I'm going to say negative 2 times negative 5 plus 6 over negative. 
negative five plus four. If you have to put the numerator, the calculator, and the denominator in the calculator, or you want to just put the whole thing in the calculator, that's okay. I just need to know what sign you get. Okay. So this is going to turn out to be a positive 10, isn't it? Plus six more is going to make it a bigger positive. Down at the bottom, what am I going to end up with? Positive or negative? Negative. The bigger number here is negative. And then when I divide those signs, I actually end up with a negative sign. And so is a negative greater than or equal to zero? No. So this section does not work for us. What number can we test in the middle here? Yes, my favorite. So essentially, this term and this term are not even there, are they? Right? It's zeros. So you end up with a positive six on the top and a positive four at the bottom. Once you divide positive and a positive, you get a positive. Are positive greater than or equal to zero? They are. So this section is good for us. Now the last section. What number do we want to test? So negative two times four plus six over four plus four. So here we're gonna get a negative eight. What happens when I do a negative eight plus six? What do you get? Negative eight plus six. Negative two. So the top is negative. And what sign do I get at bottom? Positive. And so when I divide these signs, I end up with a negative. And it's a negative greater than or equal to zero. So before I write my final answer, I do know that it's going to be negative four to three. I just don't know whether they're parentheses or brackets here. Okay. The denominator number, the key number that came from the denominator was negative four. So negative four should automatically have parentheses because it came from the denominator, right? But for the key number that came from the numerator, you have to look at your inequality, okay? It has a bar, doesn't it? So then there should be a bracket at the three. And then in my final answer, this guy will have a parentheses, but this guy will have a bracket. Came from. Oh, this one we haven't seen yet. It's always been a three, right? On the other side. Now it's not a three. Not a three in it, but it's not just a three. Okay. We do have to fix this one. And just like with the three, I would just minus it over, right? It's the same thing with this fraction. You're going to take that fraction and you're just going to minus it over. If it were already negative, what would I do to move it over? If this were negative, I would just add it over. Exactly. So there would be a plus sign in here. Okay. Keep your symbol, and then now there will be nothing on the right hand side because I moved that fraction over. Everything is exactly the same process. It just looks different because there's different numbers here, right? So I'm still going to do the same TP rule concept. So we're multiplying the 2 times the x minus 3, we're multiplying the x plus 5 times the negative 1, and then we're multiplying the two denominators together, right? Why do I keep calling it the TP? Because it literally looked like a TP when I drew it all the lines, right? You're basically multiplying these guys together, multiplying those guys together, and then multiplying these guys together as well. Okay. okay. Now let's clean that up. Do not spoil the bottom because I'm eventually going to have to set this stuff equal to zero, right? And that's already factored for me and everything. So don't, don't mess with the bottom. So 
I actually end up with a positive 1x and a negative 11. Then now we have one big fraction, our symbol, and our zero. Once we have that form, we can take our numerator equal to zero and our denominator equal to zero. Okay, quick and fast. What is going to be the x value here? 11. 11. And what are going to be the two x values here? Negative 5 and positive 3. Good. So we've got three pieces on this, three numbers on this number line. 1, 2, 3. I try to evenly space them out because I know I'm going to have to work in the middle right for each one. I try to give myself a little bit of room just so my, my steps there. Which number goes on the far left? Which one of these is the smallest of the three numbers? Negative five. Negative five. Which one is the biggest of the three numbers? Eleven. And so then that leaves positive three in the middle. Right? Now, how many numbers am I going to have to check or verify or test? Four of them now. It's a little bit more lengthy, but it's still nothing like crazy new, right? What number can I test on this side? Negative seven, sure. So I have negative seven minus 11, negative seven plus five, negative seven minus three. Remember, I only care about the signs, okay? What sign will I get in the numerator? A negative. What sign will I get in the first parentheses? Right here. Will I get positive or negative? The bigger number is negative, right? So I'll end up with negative. Here they're both negative, right? So I'll definitely have a negative. Now, here's the tricky part. What will I end up with altogether? A negative. You can think of it this way, right? Won't those cross out? But you still have another negative back, don't you? Another way to think about it is if you have an even number of negatives, right? If you had two negatives, don't they turn into a positive? So if you have an even number of negatives there, you know it'll be positive. But if you have an odd number of negatives, then you know it'll be negative. And don't I have three negatives? Is it three odd? That's why it's that negative. I want everyone to think about it, so do it correctly, right? <laughs> okay, so let's try another number now in this section. Let me change the colors because I'm going to have a lot of blue all over each other. They're going to be too much. Let's try green. So let's pick another number in here. Yes, so one section will be zero. So you get zero minus 11, zero plus five, and zero minus three. What sign will I get in the numerator? What sign will I get in the first parentheses? Positive. What sign will I get in the second parentheses? Negative. And so what sign will I end up with altogether? What if I do this? What sign will I end up with? I will end up with the positive. How many negatives were there? Two, and that's even, right? So I should have a positive. Is a positive greater than zero? It is. This section works. I didn't even ask that on the other one. I did all the work and I forgot to conclude, right? <laughs> I need the conclusion here. <laughs> zero greater than, I mean, is negative greater than zero? No. So this one should have been x out. Okay, now let's switch back to blue and pick a number in this section. Sure, four. So four minus 11, four plus five, and then four minus three. So what sign do you end up with in the numerator? 
negative. What sign is the first parentheses? And what sign is the second parentheses? Positive. So what sign will you end up with altogether? How many negatives are there? Just one. Is one even or odd? Odd. So I end up with negative at the end. Is this true or false? False. Negatives are not bigger than zeros. So this section does not work. Now the very last section. What number do you want to try? 15. Okay, so we have 15 minus 11. 15 plus 5. And then 15 minus 3. What sign do we get in the numerator? What sign do we get in the first parentheses? Positive. What sign do we get in the second parentheses? Well, if everybody's positive, then it's going to be positive, right? And our positive is greater than zero. Yes, so this section is. So do, I do actually care. I was going to say, do I really care what's going on at three? I do because it, I need the three, right, for this section. I need the negative five and the three for this section, and I need the 11 for this section. So I really do care about all of the parentheses and the brackets. So these came from the denominator, which means that both of these two numbers should have what symbols? Parentheses. So I'm going to put a parenthesis so that it encompasses this little region. And then this one came from the numerator. So in order for me to decide, I have to look at the symbol. So what kind of uh, symbols do I put here based on this inequality? Parentheses. And so I need to cover this section, right? So I need to go that way. And so what is my final answer here? It's going to be parentheses, negative 5, and 3, and then the other section, 11, to what? Infinity. And infinities always have parentheses. Basically, the only time you'll have brackets is when the original problem had a bar and you only put that bracket on the people that came from the numerator, right? Those are the only people that are going to have brackets. Is if there was a bar in your problem at the beginning and you got those numbers from the numerator, right? Okay, so that's it for this paper, the lecture guides, but let's go take a quick look at with the side real quick and make sure that there's nothing too crazy going on in there that we haven't talked about. So then this weekend, you really can get a jump on all your homework, right? If you're not busy during the weekend. Um, if you are busy during the weekend, you still have Monday to do all the homework. Okay, we are not going to have a lecture on Monday. So use that time to catch up on your homework. Try to work on the review so that when we come back on Tuesday to talk about the review, I can like specifically get to wherever it is you're confused. Okay, that's the best way to prepare for the test. If you try it, you tweak whatever's going on in your brain, and then you're set, right? Okay, so. Let's see, that is, so skip it three again. <laughs> but we know how to do this one. I don't even think they're asking you that. Just says determine whether each x value is a solution or not. How would I decide whether or not it was a solution? You are literally, we have literally done it like 10 times today already. Every single time we tested a number and we said it was true or false, we were deciding whether or not that number was a solution to the inequality. You just phrased it different, okay? If I phrase it in a way that says, if you test all of these numbers, do you get true or do you get false, right? I only want you to check the ones where you get true, okay? So if you were to plug in 13, in for x here and in for x there, is the result actually greater than or equal to 3, okay? You don't need to do it, I'm just talking it out to you, okay? Then you would try this one, then this one, and this one. All the ones that give you true are the ones you're going to check. Okay, only the ones that give you true. Same thing for these. It's just they're squaring the numbers, so make sure you actually square them, right? 
and check all of them. All the ones that give you true are the ones you select. Okay. Now here, it is very similar to what we've done. We actually have done. How many key numbers am I going to get from the numerator? I think I did that exact same problem, didn't I? I feel like I did. Maybe I didn't. I did do that exact same problem. I already know the answer to that one. Is there anything red in it? There it is. So you may have a four here like I did on the practice, or you may not. Okay. Okay. You're lucky if you do. I know the answer. <laughs> but try it anyway, right? Just keep just to keep practicing the whole process. Okay, so we have an example like that one. How many solutions or key numbers would I get from this numerator? It's a square, right? So I would get two from this numerator. And then you also get another key number from the bottom, right? Now here, there's no square, so you just get one number from here, and one number from there, but I can't decide that just yet because we do have to do the whole fixing situation, right? You have to move the three over, do the TP thing, and then you can find your key numbers. Okay. Why do they keep putting three? I don't know, but whatever. Well, this one's red, so it might not be a three for you. This one is uh, just black, so it's going to be a three for you. Okay. But these numbers might be different. We did do a problem like almost exactly like this, it's not this exact problem. Um, and then we did do one like this, except again, those numbers were a little bit different. Is this any different from the previous one? Is different numbers, but process is all exactly the same. Okay. Uh, this one's actually good to go, but how many key numbers are you going to get from the numerator here? Squared, it's two. The highest power tells you how many. Okay. And then how many key numbers are you going to get from the denominator? Another two. So if I've got four key numbers, that means you're going to have to test five different regions, okay? Here you'll have two key numbers from the top and one key number from the bottom. And that's it. So there really isn't anything too crazy that you don't have kind of a guide for in the practice, okay? So definitely, definitely try that. So don't forget, we have, this is it. This is all the information you're going to have, um, but our test is not until Wednesday. Okay, so almost a whole week before we have that test. So really use that time to practice all this stuff in your homework, practice it again in a review, and then we'll get to your questions on Tuesday, and then we'll do the test on Wednesday. Okay. If you want to take the test sooner than that, you can just let me know and I'll give it to you online. Okay, because there's some people that are like, it's all here, I just need to get it out. <laughs> and hurry up and get this over with. Okay, and if that's the case, just let me know and I'll make it all available for you. Okay. Anybody have any questions? No? Okay, just keep an eye out because you guys are going to leave me for the weekend. I'm not going to see you until Tuesday. Um, keep an eye out for that uh, midterm report that I sent each of you. Uh, I'll be sending them out tomorrow. Okay, so just keep an eye out for that. Just so you have an idea of how you're doing and then tips on what to do from here. Okay. So that's it. You guys have a great weekend. We've got a short day today. Finish before nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, definitely. I reply whenever I text, so don't ever feel like you're bothering me or anything like that. Because I just get to it when I get to it. If I'm super busy, I'll probably. <laughs> as soon as I do, I will respond.